Thanks for everyone here. I'm really glad to see you and really glad to talk about this topic that I'm particularly very passionate about. Um, first of well, first of all, just as a very quick introduction, I'm not going to get super in, in, in depth, but basically I'm here to represent Google slash Mandiant, uh, particularly from the cyber physical team. Uh, that's one of my main areas of expertise. The other one, information operations. But unfortunately, we will only talk about cyber physical in here. And to begin, the first thing that I wanted to do is ask, I have a couple questions. First of all, does, is anyone familiar with this painting? Yeah, it's clearly AI. Actually, it says there, but I just love asking because sometimes I've got once uh, some hands. Um, so anyway, no, it, this is just an AI image that I made for fun, uh, basically asking... I, when I was trying to come up with how to put up this talk specifically, I just realized that there was opportunity to do, you know, play a bit more on, on where this is going and understand now that we have more more data uh, of where cyber physical is going, OT. And then I came up with this this concept that was just like industrial plus renaissance. Let's see how it looks like. That's what it says. Um, but the point in here is to bring up the concept of renaissance. Most often when we think about that, it refers to something antique. Yeah, basically the uh, old times. But basically, it refers to any type of period when, when there is innovation, where there is, a break, let's say, the paradigm breaks and, the, and something new comes up. And that is what we're seeing in the field of OT security, of industrial control system security. And that is why we are getting right now into this. So the second question is, has anyone here worked with operational technology, control systems, or works with that right now? Anyone with that specific expertise? I see one, two, three hands. Well, then this is even more perfect because then you're going to see something entirely different and then it's going to be hopefully even more interesting. Uh, but basically, to get everyone on the same on the same boat, what I refer to by mentioning operational technology, ICS, control systems, uh, it refers to the intersection between computing, between engineering and computing. Uh, so basically, we're not going to be talking only about uh, about endpoints, about computers, but also about the overlap with different type of engineering equipment, such as logical controllers, remote terminal units, sensors, actuators, and, and, and whatnot. So when you go to the very specifics of this field, the good news is that after you read this, you can say, look, I know everything about OT security because historically we have very few cases that have been documented with, with these type of attacks. Uh, but obviously there's much more. This is just a, a way of saying it. But, but what you can tell is that in these 13 years, let's say, uh, we haven't seen a ton of attacks that have been uh, playing on the, on this type of like very niche type of skills. Um, what makes it more interesting though right now, at, as like, like to come and speak right now, is that during the first 10 years or, or, or whatnot, we saw a couple attacks very specific against controllers. Triton was something extremely specific. Literally when, when I tell it around, it sounds almost like, like something you come up with, but there are blocks. It's, it's probably documented. Uh, basically a specific, Nation state sponsored attack that develops malware very specifically for something controlled, for, for something called, um, safety instrumented systems that is on the lower level almost before being able to blow up something, basically. That, that's a terrible summary. You can check the blog if you want. Um, but then after that, we saw during two, two specific cases, we started thinking, what is the new OT malware that's going to happen now that we've seen four or five? Maybe there's going to be more. And instead, what we started seeing was overlap with ransomware overlap with hacktivists, overlap with um, what we call crimes of opportunity, which is people looking for exposed industrial controls. Um, and yeah, you know, we started seeing more of these type of smaller things. And then in 2022, something very important and unhappy happened, which is basically we began with a conflict in Ukraine. And from there, everything has continued to become much quicker. We're starting to see not anymore like looking and only hunting for what it's interesting, but also it comes to us much more often. We saw cases like in controller, in destroyer version two. Those also, if you want, we have already blogs, talks and whatnot. Uh, but right now I'm going to focus on the things from 2023, particularly Vulcan leaks and cosmic energy are the most interesting ones. And I'm going to mention two vulnerabilities, which is weird, but I will explain a bit why that becomes relevant in this context. So in this period of innovation that I was mentioning, of basically the renaissance of uh, physical capabilities, uh, the last thing that we observed or identified was this cosmic energy malware. Uh, particularly, I'm gonna, this is the one that I'm going to get more in depth so, so that we can then discuss uh, about the specifics. 
But first disclaimer, cosmic energy has nothing to do with the meme. Uh, I actually, actually, a French friend mentioned there's a meme of, of a guy that says something like cosmic poissons or something like that. I don't know, but um, anyway, if you know it, it has nothing to do. So in this case, the, the first thing is how do we find it? What, what, what is it that, that's cosmic energy? Because just to highlight, OT malware or malware for this type of controllers and whatnot has only been found not, not in an attack or not by, by some sketchy ways or whatever, but rather only identified via threat hunting in two occasions, at least that comes public. One of them was 2014. It was called Iron Gate, uh, something about Siemens devices. And then this one, which is Cosmic Energy. And it was from one of our hunters that was looking into a, a malware analysis sandbox, came up with a different rules that, that come up from, from observation of different OT malware. And then, you know, based on those, some, some of those, um, I'd say trends that he has observed that I'm going to mention later, uh, he was able to run into this, submitted from our location in Russia. And well, that, that's basically all the information we had at the time. But what is Cosmic Energy? Basically, Cosmic Energy, first of all, is malware that is developed to uh, basically for electric power disruption. That's like, like, like the easiest way to, to, to say it. Basically, it is a simple sort of tool that interacts with a specific industrial protocol called IEC 104 and basically uses this protocol to turn on and off uh, basically switches um, and relays. And basically, it's, it's like if you just had like 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 the switch to turn on on and off power. It it is a bit more complicated. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna mention a bit more. But basically, the two interesting things that we found here was first of all that some of the capabilities that it has are or most of them actually, if not all, are uh, similar to older OT malware, just a simplified version. Uh, and the second one is that it was most likely developed as a red teaming tool, which was something that also came up from our analysis. Uh, as we continue to advance through the research. This is basically how we illustrate cosmic energy, how it would look like from a, from a high level perspective. Um, basically, it, it, is, it is comprised of two different modules. The first module, um, this uh, basically Python compiled. It basically, the, the actor is gonna deploy that module. And then the only thing that it's gonna do is it's gonna send, it's gonna interact with the MSQL server and there it's gonna deploy the second module, Lightwork which is the one that contains the instructions to communicate with the remote terminal unit, which is the engineer equipment that actually does a switch on, switch off. Um, just to clarify, I know it sounds very, very simple, uh, because I'm talking about turning off the power, so it's kind of like, probably it would be very sad if it was so simple to turn off the power. It is not as simple, just to clarify. Of course, there are different type of locks, there are different type of things, but the same logic that happened in this attack has been used in some attacks that were actually successful in 2015, 2016. So that's where it's, well, and, and also 2022, they, they reproduce something similar. I'll mention a bit more. But then basically, the interesting thing here is that this tool responds to some trend that we've seen of, of uh, the malware getting more modular so that it can be deployed with different tools. So it's not a one tool that you use for destroying everything, but rather one tool that you use in a combination with a series of attacks. And that is what makes it uh, more efficient. And what you see here is basically when we started analyzing, uh, some interesting things to find is on the opposite corner, you see IOA. Those are codes that are the, the codes that send that specific instruction and of on, off, or whatever it wants to say. And the trick in there is that most often, if you are an um, industrial organization, your engineers uh, or the vendor or you know, whomever is going to set up this device is going to determine those IOAs. So if you're the attacker, you need to know what IOAs you're going to use. You need to know, obviously, the IP addresses. You need to know uh, what protocols you're going to use. And then all of those, th the tool asks you to do the inputs so that then you can go and deploy, not against one, but against multiple targets. But again, that's where the trick is. It lacks the discovery capabilities that would make it something that you can just deploy and make it happen, which is one of the most interesting things we find in, in this type of, of attack recently. And there's one other thing to highlight in here, and it is that the sample we obtained had some logical errors. So basically, yeah, sometimes you try to run it, and actually after the, the, the second module Lightwork deploys itself, it, it actually is, is meant to send instructions, and then it's meant to erase itself. So we found that if we just run this, sometimes it would just erase itself without even doing anything, which would, would be weird. And we tried to use some commands that, that had not been deployed yet, so it was also weird, but when we tried to fix it, it was fairly easy. It was one or two lines of code. 
So in the end, uh, what we determined is, is, well, most likely, yeah, of course, there was some test going on in here, probably some, some perfection. They were going to work a bit more on that, or who knows? And that is where the red teaming process comes up. So when we had this tool, the first thing we thought is, this is exciting. This is going to be the next piece of Ultima where we've only seen six, seven in life. So let's come on and let's put up the next one. It's going to be very interesting. And we were about to publish. But then looking into, we continued to look in the, in the code to try to identify why was this kind of like simple, good in, in skills, but also kind of like simple-ish. Um, and then we, we found something specific that was uh, this mention of the solar polygon. Another question for everyone. Do you know what a solar polygon is? I would not expect that uh, because precisely it doesn't seem to be anything. Uh, there is actually some research paper that I, I, I ran into that, that seems to be suggesting solar polygon as, as how to measure the irradiation of sunshine against blah, blah. Uh, but basically, yeah, it, it does not really mean anything uh, uh, at all. And that is why it caught our attention. We started looking, couldn't find more than that research paper. We thought maybe it's some reference, a project or something. And then when you actually looked at it in Cyrillic, then we found what we were looking for. Uh, it turns out that, well, first of all, Solar Polygon is, as you can tell, a library, but like, it belongs to Solar Polygon, uh, something they're using for this, uh, for part of the attack with MSQL and IEC 104. And basically, what we found there was that it referred to Polygon, which, I mean, I wasn't aware of this, but apparently you, when you have like a training range, it can also be called Polygon, like, for example, where policemen go and shoot, if anyone hears in, uh, in, in police or whatnot. And basically, then the solar refers to a company that's called Solar, precisely, for cybersecurity, that was recently acquired by another company called Ros Telecom, one, a very large uh, telecommunications uh, organization in Russia. So they bought solar, and then they created on their uh, sponsorship from the government the Ros Telecom Solar Polygon. This polygon that was from some grants in 2019 uh, basically was meant to do a couple different things. One of them was, yeah, on different uh, purposes, what, let's figure out how we can protect and whatnot. And the other one was, let's basically illustrate or reproduce power disruption exercises. So it seems like there's a very high probability that it has to do with what we've done. There are some exercises that have been public. Some of them, for example, in, I believe, uh, some, some economic forum. Um, and yeah, it seems like, most likely, it might be related. They might be trying to reproduce this in, in a small power facility or whatnot and see how it would look like. Um, but yeah, you know, there's, there's always a likelihood that we are wrong. Maybe, you know, it's just too many coincidences and we put our tin hats and we're coming up with all this explanation and maybe there is something different going on. So we want to put out for everyone to define this attribution since we don't have it officially. Um, and to provide some context on that, what you see in here is a timeline of uh, Russian-sponsored threat activity, particularly for OT, which means that basically for people in OT, they have brought most of the work that everyone has done in the field. Uh, that is actually fairly interesting. So yeah, it corresponds with that. It also corresponds with the trend of being more modular, of generating smaller tools instead of more specific that can't be reproduced. Because before, you know, those tools required so much so many resources. And right now, if you do something like this, you can combine it with different attacks and then actually probably even be more efficient. Uh, and the two things, the two cases that are, uh, you can see two arrows in here. The reason why I pointed those is because this uh, specific malware is very similar to those two attacks, basically in Destroyer uh, and in Destroyer version two. It actually, in Destroyer first was this, this uh, malware that they use for, for power outage in Ukraine, 2016, close to Christmas, terrible for a couple hours. And then basically, uh, what they did was, was a much more comprehensive malware that interacted with different protocols that had, it, it was basically much, much more complicated. But then industry version two, which was deployed during the conflict right now in, in, in Ukraine, in at least a couple uh, Ukrainian power facilities, this one only used one of the modules from Industrier, which was the one for IEC 104, which is basically the same protocol that our malware is right now using. So, on those same lines, uh, mentioning these similarities with Destroyer version one and version two, the first thing is we see that the three pieces of malware, of course, have to have to do with uh, basically energy power disruption. The second thing is they follow the same process, not only because of the same protocol, the IEC 104, 
but also because they also they are also based on, on on this idea of let's just send the instructions to the to the RTU that are going to say on and off to switches and relays. And then the second, the, the, sorry, the, the third and last thing. Oh well, I was missing the MS SQL Server. That's another another thing that was a step through the attack. And the last one was um, references to a unique application, OIK. This is basically something for telemetry, for OT. It's not regularly used everywhere. It's just something very specific. Seems to be some most likely Ukrainian company or whatnot. And basically, it was used in at least you know most likely in these facilities. We saw it in different ways referenced in, in in both pieces of software. So I mean, in the worst case, it is based on that. So then here comes the question, and this is something that when we put out this research, for some people, they were saying, okay, then this is a big deal. Some people say it isn't, and then we got a bit of discussion on both sides. And what I would like is for you to be able to decide that, not, not, not for me specifically. From our perspective, we sit sort of in the middle. It is, of course, uh, a big deal from the sense that it shows how with much less resources, it is now possible to create this tooling, that the bar is going much lower for the actors. But on the other hand, it also it's also something that we don't expect probably to see in the wild. It is possible, but probably not. And so here are those uh, so some of those um, things to consider. First of all, yeah, there's a remote possibility that the tool was developed for an attack. We won't know, or hopefully we won't know. The second thing, uh, when that, that, that means that the actors can develop this type of tool with less resources by basing on prior OT malware, which before wasn't a concern because there was no prior OT malware or there was very few and fairly specific. Um, actually, this is very interesting because when Indestroyer was exposed in back in 2016, everyone thought no one would use it again. It was exposed. They just lost burn capabilities that they probably spent years developing. And now we saw 2022 how actually they were not as burnt. They could just go and reproduce and against multiple facilities at a time. So that was actually something very interesting. Um, the other thing is, yeah, well, it's a red team tool. Yeah, it doesn't mean that it cannot be leveraged by an attacker. Some people just hear red team and then they, don't, they are not concerned. But, you know, it is basically a tool that you can use. That's the reason why it exists. And the last one is... Um, Assuming that this came from a contractor, like like Rosellecom Solar and whatnot, and not specifically from like a nation state actor and whatnot, still there are nation states that are leveraging contractors to do the you know to develop this type of tooling. Uh, sorry, yeah, what you see on here, actually on the right, is is documentation from one of those contractors. This comes from a from a leak earlier this year, I believe, that it was a uh, NTK Vulcan leaks. That is a series of papers that we identified from the from, um, uh, organization working with Russian Ministry of Defense. And basically, we found three different papers. This here, the Scan Amnesty Crystal B. And what they were is, I invite you to take a look at our blog. It's very interesting. It, they do not show us how the, the, the technical capability looks like, but they were asking for the requirements from a vendor to what they wanted. So they were saying, I want you to be able to collect all these data about vulnerabilities, about exposed devices, about network traffic, about social media, about OT, about basically everything, put it together, build a platform, and then my, my guys can use it for whatever good things that, of course, they had in mind. Um, and what made also more, more interesting was, was this combination of, like, let's combine the psychological portion, like the information operations, with the actual uh, OT, with the actual IT. So... It, it, it gets something very, you know, very, very interesting, uh, kind of like a, a scary as well in, in, in a way. And particularly from the perspective of OT, these documents had something very interesting, which was in some of the requirements, they mentioned some specific cases for targeting rail systems and oil and gas. So literally the list that you see in here, manipulating speeds, creating unauthorized track transfers, I don't know, closing valves, shutting down pumps, spoiling materials, those were the requirements for the vendors. Develop malware that can help me uh, go and focus on something like this. So again, it matches something like, like cosmic energy. It is particularly for, for, well, well, for energy. It doesn't mean it has to be this contract, but it shows that, you know, there is investment in this type of tooling. And that is why, why we're, we're, we are seeing the development. And so the last, the, the last piece here, and in terms of like, like for, for defining what, what is, what is the value, I have this, uh, old, let's say most recent case that we saw of the disclosure of two vulnerabilities. They were related to Rockwell automation devices, again, industrial, very specific. Um, I believe it was control logics. And basically what you see in here, in general, considering there are thousands of vulnerabilities, hundreds of thousands, uh, over a hundred thousand, I believe, uh, then this is, it should be just one more. You can patch it, right? 
But actually, it's not that easy for industrial devices. There are multiple reasons why it, it can be much more complicated. And particularly, the reason why these ones were very interested is because they were exposed by, uh, in, in a, it was actually made public by U.S. governments in collaboration with Rockwell Automation based on some exploits that they identified, likely produced by an APT that they are familiar with, that most likely, you, I mean, I'm assuming one of the ones you've, you've, you've seen here most likely. Um, and basically, yeah, so you're talking about APT capabilities, uh, developing this type of exploits, particularly for control systems, and mapping to what we saw in another attack called, in, well, not attack, but like another tool called in controller earlier in 2022. Uh, I don't have time to get into that, but I invite you also to take a look into, into the blog, uh, which makes it very, very concerning. And so to, like, like, like to wrap up on defining what, what the implication is from this, like from a red tooling or not perspective, I just wanted to make the cat analogy, which I found amazing. Um, that is basically the fact that you have an equation. It's not, you know, it's, it's in order for something to, to, to generate risk, you're going to have this, this type of, of, of considerations. And it's basically what does it mean for this tool to be actually offensive in, in capability? And there are two things. The first one is a tool. Can the tool do something that is damaging? Yeah. It can interact with devices that you shouldn't interact because you can turn off the power to people that actually might need the power. And then the intent, the, the intent, sorry, the intent is something that we don't know. So that is actually the question. What was the intent of the attacker? This is similar uh, when we talk about red teaming tools to the paws of a cat, right? Basically, they have tools, and the tools are the cutest ever. You can just, you know, they're fluffy and amazing. But actually, with those tools, the cat can walk, it can get food, it can be fluffy, it can be happy, but it can also scratch your face whenever it wants. And that is kind of very similar to what we see with this type of red teaming tool. Basically, we just want, we just don't know if they are planning to, to scratch or it's just there to for defense or just to be happy and you know they will continue to develop other tools. And so just to I don't like to leave this just on a question of like what was was it red team tool? No, let's discuss and whatnot. I so I, I wanted to also provide something like like interesting in case you're in case you find this interesting and you would like to be the person to discover the next, let's say I think it's like seventh or eighth piece of OT malware. Uh, and so I wanted to share some of the let's say learnings from our threat hunters, and particularly the guy that, that, that found this. And we came up with this, these three things that we were finding consistently with old team malware, with old pieces. That was, first of all, the abuse of protocols are insecure by design, like IEC 104. Basically, the point with these protocols is you can just use them to communicate as long as you know how to do it. So if you develop any malware for one of these, it's going to be, it could be used for any type of device that uses that, that type of protocol. It does not really have like the same security that you see in other OT domains. The second one was uh, open source libraries. Given that these protocols can be fairly specific, there are a ton of open source libraries that you can use to interact with them. And those ones are also some things that we see including this type of malware because it's much easier to just grab the public library than to actually go and build a way to go and learn about the protocol, how to interact with it, how it works and whatnot. So that's something that you can also definitely use in, in, in your threat hunting. And the last one, which is probably the main highlight, is the is Python. Uh, Python for development and packing, packaging. This is going to sound ridiculous. I probably could imagine that some people are going to be like, yeah, of course, you know, I'm going to look for Python everywhere. I'm just going to get stuff, stuff, stuff. Um, but actually, that's not true. Because that is true when you're holding to an IT network. Yeah, for sure. But when you're actually talking about an industrial environment where you, where you have this type of equipment, the engineering and whatnot, you normally have much more control over what programming languages are running there. And most often it is not so new and so easy as to just go and, and deploy a ton of Python. Oftentimes there's going to be other languages and wherever this type of, of, of Python code might be present, there is going to be documentation and there are going to be specific use cases. So that is where you can find, uh, for example, if something is being deployed where it shouldn't, this actually is some of the things that has tipped us and, and is consistent literally with all the pieces of malware that we've seen, but also not with the industrial in the industrial sections necessarily. This is just to reinforce this, this, uh, this is actually not for me, it's from the, from the hunter. I'm going to be honest and I'm not entirely familiar with his reference, but he really wanted it there and I said I'll respect it. Uh, but yeah, basically the point is just to, ha to highlight that this, this type of uh, strategy for hunting for OT malware based on, on, on Python seems to be very efficient. And, well, it's for you to take if you decide. 
With some general accommodations, uh, last, lastly, with this uh, for cosmic energy, we have, of course, uh, collection integration of logs. That's something that, that sounds very logical, but again, from an industrial perspective, can have a bit more complications. We can talk more about that if you decide. Of course, we have the, the Python things that we discussed a couple of minutes ago. And another big one that we wanted to highlight was the MS SQL, because, I mean, as you might have heard always, on the industrial side, we tend to have the things a bit more separate. So if you have any type of uh, MS SQL servers that interact with OT data that might have this type of connection with, with OT environments, that is somewhere where you can start looking for the deployment of these type of tools. Main takeaways to wrap up. I think I have like one minute, so it should be perfect. Uh, the first one is, yeah, the, the barriers of, of entry for actors in general for OT malware are becoming lower. We've seen how back in the use of Stocknet, this was extremely complicated and only one or two types of devices. And then you have to develop probably years and have large teams to develop. And right now we're getting to this point where you have these small modules that can be deployed next to other malware that does not necessarily need to be as complicated. Uh, the second thing is cosmic energy capabilities. Yeah, it, this new tool, it doesn't seem to be entirely unique. It is definitely based on other type of malware we've seen in the past, which also shows that it definitely is worth looking for those type of malware, even though for some people uh, they thought that once you see it, it's burnt. It definitely is not. And that is what we're seeing from Indestroyer to Indestroyer 2 and now Cosmic Energy. Um, mm -mm. And the last one, I think, yeah, would be the last one that I want to highlight is the one on contractors. Just to remind on the, on the red teaming side, on the use of contractors and whatnot, yes, there is an interest in this tooling. Yes, there is an investment. And it is all going to be a matter of, of, of intent to determine how they're going to be used to. So definitely keeping an eye for them. And that's it from my side. I believe I will have like 10 seconds more. But, well, I think there's like two or three minutes, so it should be okay. But, yeah, thanks for everything. Uh, that's all on my side. And, yeah, I don't know if I, any questions or something. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. Uh, just a minor note. Uh, the specific of IT environment is that... You can install patches on the service intervals, which could be like once in three months. But another side of this, uh, the behavior of the OT environment is way more predictable than IT environment. So any anomalies like one unsuccessful login attempt should be a red flag in this environment. So it's easy to profile anom anomalies while it's harder to patch, just a note. Yeah, no, no, I entirely agree. That, that is why uh, some, some things that might seem very obvious from an from agile perspective, like this, look for Python, look for MySQL, look for those things that might be very obvious, uh, well, definitely depends much more on the baseline you have, uh, which is going to be much more repetitive. Of course, there are also anomalies, like if some value gets, gets out for any reason, if there's any safety situation. But in general, yeah, you, you should be able to know what to expect. Just come, we have to just come yeah. closer here. Come I don't know. Is there any other question? There is one more question here, but you have to come. Uh, very short question. Thanks for the very interesting talk, but one very short question. You said that the barriers to entry to operational technology are going down, but is it going down for like organized state groups or perhaps individuals? Uh, what would happen, let's say, in five to ten years? And lastly, uh, surely it's not the case that in a few years just about anyone will be able to blow up a, a blast furnace at a steel mill or something. Yeah, I know, of course, of course. Uh, well, first of all, who are these barriers going down for? There are a couple different responses. There are three types of, of, of attackers that we see mainly on the OT side. First of all, we have hacktivists, which right now haven't, I mean, they are doing a great job of investigating, of growing and whatnot, but we still see a lot of attacks that are definitely very far from any of these levels. So it's not going to be for normal individuals. Um, the second one that we're seeing is obviously on the, on the ransomware side. We do have overlaps that, that the techniques used by ransomware actors tend to be very similar to the ones from nation state. So at that level, if there was an incentive, you could probably see it, but I don't think there's any incentive. You can make much more money as you do it right now. And the third one for nation state, yeah, that is, so it would be more like lowering the barrier at the nation state level, uh, just simply by the fact that there's already more, more tooling, more openness on what they've done, how it would work. 
and also by this separation of, mo of doing the, the malware more modular. Instead of focusing on one single big attack, focusing on developing the capabilities and then having people to go and conduct the attack, which is what we are seeing during the conflict 2022 right now and the one in, in, in Hamas ongoing. In, in Israel, sorry, in Hamas. Yeah. And with that, thank you very much, Daniel.